also to uh, uh, thank warmly uh, Professor N.K. Dutta for his uh, nice invitation to this conference. Um, and also I want to thank all the organizers here because uh, they have been so nice to, uh, to all of us. Thank you. Um, so uh, I should introduce myself. Uh, so thanks, I say uh, that I come from the MIT, meaning uh, Mathematical Institute of Toulouse. Um, and uh, Toulouse is a pretty lovely uh, city in the south of France. Uh, that is, uh, that has a very nice ancient flavor with beautiful architecture, but it is also well known as uh, the European capital for uh, aerospace industry. Uh, the work I'm going to present is uh, done in collaboration with a team from uh, a university, McGill University in, in Canada. Um, essentially, it was a team of Tim Horizon and uh, their students, Gabriel Rio and Christopher Scarbillis. Um, I selected this topic because uh, we have seen a tremendous improvement in the possi computing possibilities over the past decades. And I also have noticed that sometimes this would make us a bit lazy in uh, the mathematical mod modeling part because we know that we have so much capacity for computing, so why should we uh, bother um, uh, spending time on, on the mathematical modeling uh, in a very clean way? And um, you will understand why I'm saying that in, in a few seconds, in a few minutes. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction about barcodes. Barcodes are uh, used to encode uh, uh, transactions. Um, and uh, there are essentially two types of barcodes, uh, the UPC format and uh, also the QR barcodes. Um, they have invi invi invaded our lives. Obviously, we find them everywhere. And uh, sometimes we have to scan them, for example, with a smartphone. And this process is not, uh, obviously, is not perfect, and uh, that's why we need to uh, to uh, use some techniques so so as to deep learning, for example. Um, one aspect of barcodes is that they are highly structured images. There are binary images, and also there are there are zones in the image uh, which are uh, a priori uh, prescribed. Uh, so you have uh, symbolic constraints in, in uh, each barcode. This is an example for the UPC format, and this is what can be seen. You, you see that there, there are uh, places in the, in the barcode that have prescribed uh, items. So um, in this presentation, we shall model the barcode by a vector x, which takes uh, each component of which can take either the zero uh, value for uh, black, for example, or one. And uh, this uh, each component is, is will be modeled as a uh, Bernoulli uh, random variable. Uh, for example, for UPC, you see that capital N is, is 95, while for QR uh, codes, uh, N ranges from uh, uh, 400. Uh, 41 to 31,329, which is pretty big. And uh, the modeling we are using for the, the acquisition of the barcode by your, your smartphone is um, something that uh, takes account for uh, what, what is uh, blurring. And also we need to uh, consider that the image that is produced by your smartphone is sampled in, in a much smaller rate and the size of the pixels in the barcode. So we have an upscaling uh, uh, matrix here, and um, this is followed by a discrete convolution. Um, so um, the matrix C, that is the global convolution matrix here, is, is it models both this upscaling uh, step and the blurring of X with a point spread function C. Uh, unfortunately, in practice, the point spread function is not known uh, because it, uh, it, it can be due to just the movement of the, of the smartphone when you acquire the image. Uh, 
So this is typically a problem of blind dividend deblurring. So in the equation B equals Cx, you only measure B, and you, you don't know C, and you don't know X. So how could this be uh, solved? Of course, it, it's a very, very difficult problem, especially if you have no prior information. But here, in this case, we can, uh, we can get by just by using the, the, the prior knowledge we have. As I said, barcodes are very highly structured uh, objects. And that we are going to see how we can uh, um, get by. So just before we, we go into the theory of, of this, uh, I just want to give you an order of magnitude. 2 to the n is the number of possible uh, barcodes that you ha have if you have n elements, like for example, n rays in a UPC barcode or n square pixel in a QR barcode. And uh, if n is equal to 266, this, this number is comparable to the estimated number of particles in the known universe. And for just the smallest QR barcodes, n is greater than or equal to 441. Um, so I'm now going to, to talk about the principle of maximum entropy on the mean. Uh, we consider again our linear equation, Cx equals b, with a temporary assumption that c is known. And in fact, recall that c is not known. So what we are going to do is that to each uh, component of x we shall uh, uh, associate a, a discrete probability. Uh, so, in fact, every component of, of, uh, of P here is one possible barcode in the space that has cardinality 2 to the n. Hence, uh, P is a member of R to the 2 to the n, where the keith component of P represents the probability assigned to the keith barcode, uh, keith element, uh, bar, uh, to the keith barcode in, in uh, 2 to the n, this uh, huge space. And the idea of the maximum entropy on the mean is to work not on x, but rather on the probability distribution of x. Uh, so what we do is that we shall uh, minimize something that will impose a fit to the model through the expectation operator. Here, EP means the expectation under the probability t. Plus, one penalization that will uh, be taken to be the uh, kubak liger uh, relative entropy with respect to some prior uh, uh, probability measure. And I will say more about this prior in a, in a few seconds. So uh, once we have done that, we minimize with respect to p, and therefore we obtain uh, something that is an optimal probability distribution. And the nature of choice for our reconstructed object is to take, again, the mathematical expectation of x under this probability. So that's what we do. But since we know that x should be either zeros or ones, we, we just threshold this result. So we take the expectation first, and then we threshold. Let's say if we are less than one half, we, took zero, we take zero. If we are above one half, we take one. That's the global strategy. And we'll see that uh, although p here, the dimension of p can be more than the number of particles in the universe, uh, we shall be ac actually able to, to do such computations just by mixing uh, computing on the computer, but also some mathematical reasoning. Um, as for the prior mu, well, we haven't seen much so far, but we could just take a uniform prior, which means that we want to select the probability that, can take, that is uh, maximally non-committal non with respect to what we know. Or we could more intelligently uh, select a prior that, uh, that uh, relies on the known symbology of the, of the barcode, um, which, for example, would impose the, these uh, predefined structures to be, to be uh, zeros and ones exactly where we know they should be. Um, and we can also combine this together with uh, uh, maybe statistics, I think, at some point. In this presentation, we'll essentially focus on the middle part here. So, we we'll only impose the constraints uh, uh, related to the symbol of this. 
So obviously the uh, uh, optimization problem that we are dealing with, our entropy, maximum entropy uh, so the solution is completely uh, numerically intractable for the range of n that we are considering. Uh, and our strategy uh, will combine something that, uh, that is well known in uh, optimization, in the field of optimization and convex analysis. This is the Fenker, Fenker uh, Rockefeller duality. And this will, uh, this first step will enable us to reduce from 2 to the n to nm. Recall that m here is the, the upscaling factor, the factor that uh, roughly speaking says that uh, in one little square of the QR particle you have m pixels for the image. Uh, and, uh, and in the second step, we will exploit the probabilistic structure of, uh, of the problem uh, in order to avoid actually computing p-bar and access directly to x-bar as the mathematical expectation under p-bar of x. Um, let's see how to do that. Combine these two things together to obtain a problem that is perfectly tractable. And that, that will be, uh, as you will see, will give beautiful results. Um, when C is unknown, of course, we have to, uh, to cope with the fact that we, we, we don't know the, the blur, uh, the point spread function of, because it is also a random object. And the natural thing is to uh, then to try to alternate between the above scheme for, uh, um, with the current version of, of the blurring kernel C together with an entropy-based optimization to es estimate C from the observed signal and uh, x bar as obtained from the previous slide. So we'll just alternate these two aspects iteratively. And uh, of course, we have to start at some point and we choose to uh, uh, try to obtain a, um, an initial estimation of the blur uh, from the later, which is B, and x bar to be taken in the first iteration as the mathematical expectation of x under the prior name. Okay. So um, now I will uh, explain uh, how we do this uh, entropy line deblurring and how we can make this untractable problem tractable, perfectly tractable on a computer, even on a single PC. You can run that. So uh, I will need to uh, give a, a brief reminder of uh, Fenkel duality. This is a bit of mathematics. Um, and I will give an overview of the, of the algorithm and then we'll focus on the computations that are needed for the uh, mathematical computations needed for image estimation and the kernel estimation. Okay, so I will start with a brief reminder of uh, Fenkel duality. What I want to say first, uh, before I show uh, uh, just one of the, uh, a couple of theorems, is that uh, Fenkel duality can be compared to uh, the more familiar uh, Fourier analysis. When Fourier started to study the heat equation, he realized that it was not possible to, to solve it as it was, and he transformed the problem into the world of uh, frequencies and realized that he could get analytic solution on the frequency side and then get back to the original side by just inverting the transform that now bears his name. Uh, there is something completely similar in a complex analysis, which is factor duality. So we, in fact, have a problem in what we call the primal variable, and we will transform this problem into a problem which, whose uh, unknown is a, is a dual variable. It is somehow related to the notion of Lagrange multiplier, for those of, of you who, who know a bit of, of constraint optimization. And then once we have obtained this solution, we get back to the initial world. Uh, in which x lives, or p, or the probability lives. So, this is the thing abstract, the abstract factor to duality theorem. Suppose you are given a linear mapping from Rn to Rd. Here, n is supposed to be extremely large, so that's why this is not tractable, and d is, uh, is supposed to be more reasonable. Uh, so this is a linear mapping. Now you, are, you have a, a function f that is a convex function. Forget about everything that I put in gray. Um, and you have a concave function. 
ERG. And again, this, you forget totally, but I could not write this without being uh, rigorous, so I, I have to put it anyway. Then what we have is that we have said that this is a minimization problem, similar to the one that we have to solve here. Uh, this is a convex optimization problem. They're a priori mathematically very nice, but difficult because of the dimension here, m. And then here you have another problem that we call the dual problem, whose variable is lambda. Lambda is reminiscent of Lagrange, Lagrange multiplier. And it uses this transform, which is, let's say, the Fourier transform for convex analysis. We call this the conjugate functions. Okay? This is the con convex conjugate of f, and this is the concave conjugate of f. Oh, G, sorry. Then we'll see that we will be able to. Uh, uh, one, one observation that we need to make is that here uh, uh, we have existence of a solution implicitly because we use max instead of soup. Here at this stage we still don't know if this problem even has a solution. But uh, if we do a bit more of, of work and add some assumptions that are that absolutely trivially satisfied in our problem, uh, then we can um, we will be at some point able to relate uh, the solution of the problem of interest, the minimization problem, to the problem uh, the dual, which I call the dual problem, right? So that this, pro this theorem is a bit difficult to write if you're not familiar uh, with the notion of conjugacy, but the important thing is, is this. Uh, the, the last theorem will be uh, of particular interest when the dual function is uh, R-valued, meaning finite, everywhere. And differentiable, since then we, we, we obtain an explicit primal dual relationship, which is here. So here you see this is what you have been to obtain by maximizing the dual function, which is an easy problem. And then from this solution you can compute uh, the, the solution uh, to, the, uh, to the initial problem. Just by taking, well, the adjoint of the matrix, then uh, taking the gradient, evaluating the gradients of the conjugate in, on, on this side. Okay? And this will enable us to solve our very difficult problem by means of, of, a, of a much easier one. So let's, see, let's get back now to the overview of our uh, strategy. So this is the notation for the simplex in Rn, and it's supposed to be very, any, any number here. So that's the set of, positive, of uh, vectors with positive components that sum up to one. Uh, and this is a, a, a reminder of what a cool back library of relative entropy is. So uh, I, I guess um, most people here are familiar with this function. It is a nice, nicely behaved convex function whose convex conjugate is explicit. And therefore, um, now if, if we see that uh, in this expression, uh, we have linearity with respect to P. We can use the fact that there is some matrix representation of, of P, uh, of, of uh, the expectation of P in terms of the matrix uh, A, which is again a huge matrix just because that's, that's the second, uh, the, the number of columns in this matrix is 2 to the n. Okay, so we'll add in, in no way we can do it manipulate that on computer. So now the data shifting term in our optimization problem is, is, is uh, this uh, is this kind of function. It is just a least square term, uh, and our uh, ideally we would like to, uh, as we do usually in inverse problems, we want to minimize this uh, least square term plus the penalty with respect to each. So we need to, to do uh, a bit more work and we'll see that we get where we are. So uh, we uh, perform additional dimension uh, reduction by avoiding to compute p-bar and uh, uh, trying to access directly to the expectation under p-bar of x, which we denote uh, x-bar, okay? And that's maybe the most um, uh, tricky part of it, but very cute, in fact. If we, if we want to observe that what we uh, need to compute for the dual function, explicitly this was performed through this computation because we, we computed the convex conjugate of k 
And you see that this is a huge summation over 2 to the n terms. But now we can observe that uh, if we compute this, we obtain in fact a scalar product here between C, uh, C uh, transpose lambda and the ith column of A. And mu i, of course, is just the probability of uh, this column as, as a barcode. Okay. So here, what do you recognize here? We recognize what is called the moment generating function of our random vector, in which x is Bernoulli, and because of independence, this moment generating function here is just the product of the moment generating functions, when generating functions for each individual with individual components. And now since we have a lot, we can have a product, we can transform this into a sum uh, of, of logs. And so you see that we have moved from a uh, 2 to the n summation into uh, n summation. Okay? And that's, that's about it. Now, uh, we observe that our solution, x bar, which was this huge matrix applied to p bar, is in fact uh, also this matrix uh, uh, applied to the what we had obtained with the prime modulo solution. We see that uh, uh, by an easy computation, we can obtain this x bar as the gradient of this function, which is again a summation, a reasonable summation, applied to this to this vector. Okay. So now each step of the computer estimation has been uh, made computationally tractable. So just to uh, summarize what we have done so far, we form a Bernoulli prior here with parameter rho, vector parameter rho. Then we solve the smooth, unconstrained, low-dimensional dual problem, which gives the Lagrange multiplier lambda bar optima. And then we compute the estimated uh, image via this formula, which is perfectly tractable numerically. And after that, of course, we don't forget to perform the thresholding step to guarantee that all the segments of the barcode or the pixels of the barcode are either 0 or 1. Okay, now it seems quite simple to, to do. For the kernel estimation, there is not much to do because the kernel estimation is, is uh, numerically uh, accessible. But since we are also using uh, the same kind of structure as a problem, we can uh, also apply duality. So again, we have a linear relationship. Here, this, this term uh, can be regarded now as a function of C, as, let's say, a matrix applied to C, a reasonable matrix. But always reasonable, we can also try to adopt a dual strategy to save uh, even more space. We have here the corresponding dual problem. It's exactly the same structure of, uh, of uh, the same strategy that we are using, and uh, we, uh, we uh, finally get uh, the prime module solution here. We, again, we have uh, the Lagrange multiplier coming into the picture. So, uh, just a few remarks before I show you some uh, simulations. Uh, the use of pullback library and algorithms in the kernel estimation that guarantees that the uh, convolution kernel. Uh, belongs to the simplex, that is to say that it's uh, normalized in some sense and, and it has positive values, which is always what we get when we scan uh, a barcode. Um, uh, I have said very little about the choice of the prior in the kernel estimation. And in fact, we use it in our algorithm just to limit the support of the kernel in order to, to adopt a, a coarse to fine approach uh, in the kernel estimation. Okay, so we will, uh, um, in fact, do this alternating strategy, but starting with uh, limited support on new and enlarging it as soon as, and stop as soon as we get enough accuracy. Okay. Um, now the choice of the prior view, as I said, uh, we choose a Bernoulli a random vector, uh, and uh, of course we will uh, take the parameter to be zero if the I corresponding bar or, or a pixel in the, the QR code is fixed as black and by the barcode sim symbology. Uh, we'll take uh, row i equals 1 if uh, this is fixed to y. 
and uh, if we don't know anything, if it's not fixed, then we'll just take one, one or two in the, in the, uh, as, as, a, as a parameter for the corresponding uh, 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 family uh, distribution. So now let me show you a few simulations about this. Uh, so first, I want to uh, to show what we used uh, because these are simulations. We used the simulated uh, blur. So, for example, uh, here is the, the blurring on the left. So, blurring of, of the barcode using a discrete approximation of a Gaussian blur, a Gaussian point uh, spread function, let's say. On the, on the right hand side, it's rather a blur that corresponds to uh, movements in the direction. Uh, uh, oriented with a uh, pi over four. Okay, so this is a uniform, a uniform blur, but uh, on on a straight line. Okay, and it, it's supposed to to emulate the, the movement of the, of the of the camera or of the smartphone. So now here is uh, what we the kind of reconstruction we can we can have with this with this strategy. Quite, we, we, I must say that we were quite amazed at the, when we first obtained these results. Uh, so we have a blurred barcode here on the left. Obviously, it's totally not readable, but uh, and we blur here with gold Gaussian, and we obtain this reconstruction, uh, which is perfect actually, which is exactly the uh, original uh, barcode uh, using uh, our algorithm, in which we used as, as a prior uh, all the information that we had on, on the on the from the symbolic uh, aspects. Uh, Prior. Uh, here is, is another reconstruction in which we use the blur corresponding to motion. This is motion blur uh, with uh, nine, nine uh, by nine uh, pixels. So we get, in fact, averages of the original barcode using uh, nine neighbors um, with the orientation minus five or four. And this is again the reconstruction, which is absolutely perfect. It's, uh, it's no error reconstruction. So far, we have only used uh, blurring, and in fact, in the reality, we not only have blurring, we, but we also have addition of noise, random noise. So here is the reconstruction in which we have some uh, motion blur together with salt and pepper, uh, one percent salt and pepper uh, noise. And again, we get perfect reconstruction. Here is uh, the what we obtain with a Gaussian blur together with a, a Gaussian uh, uh, with a Gaussian uh, noise. And uh, again, we obtain perfect reconstruction. Well, I think that's uh, that's about what I had to say. Just to uh, just to conclude. Uh, here, I think it is a nice example of, of what we obtain when we uh, we have nice computing uh, from the computer side, of course, and um, and uh, also uh, good mathematical mod modeling. Uh, just to give another magnitude, the reconstruction I, I, I just, just showed took a few minutes on a regular PC, and of course, this is uh, still far too much, but with uh, improvement of. Uh, Computing cap capacity, this will become perfectly uh, uh, okay. So, thank you very much for.